some of y'all, it's getting to that time where you're kind of really, you're really aware of the people that are the hardest people to get gifts for because you are supposed to have gotten their gift by now and you haven't because they are the hardest people to get gifts for, right? Right? And there's some people that are really easy to get gifts for. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty convinced just for what it's worth that I am one of the easiest people to get gifts for. I am pretty convinced of that. And I say that just so we're clear scientifically. That's not just opinion because historical data uh, continues to show that I get myself great stuff. Like I, I'm, I, yeah, I'm really good at getting myself great stuff all throughout the year, uh, but especially around Christmas. I'm really good at getting my, I can, I can pick out the perfect things for myself, especially around Christmas. And that um, for years bothered my mom. It still does. But now it also bothers my wife. Um, so there's that. Yeah. But I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm great at it. I'm easy. I, I am very good at figuring out what I want. Um, I'm particularly gifted at gifting myself particularly great things. And it's probably, I, I'm guessing, because I spend a lot of time with me. I do, yeah. I, I spend a lot of time with me, mo- probably more than anyone else. So uh, definitely more than anyone else. So I know myself and I know what I like, yeah? That's how it works, right? Like, the better you know someone, more likely the better you are at getting gifts that they're going to like because you, you get them, because you know them. You tracking with me? That's why for Secret Santa, some of y'all get so upset when either you get somebody that you don't know or when somebody gets you and you know they don't know you, Right? Because if you're like secret Santa person or someone you don't know, you're like, oh, now I need to get to know them and get them something. Because you know that like if you know them better, you're going to get them a better gift. And if somebody gets you, obviously you don't know until they give you the gift, you know, right? Because it's called secret Santa. Some of y'all are like looking at each other because you're like, oh, in our family we cheat. But anyway, um, but have you ever gotten a gift from someone and it's immediately obvious to you that they don't know you? Yeah, right? You're like, oh, yeah, that's getting regifted. Like, you immediately know. You're just like, I, I have no desire for it. Like, that, that you don't, I really, I was thinking about this as I was, like, getting ready to say this. I wrote down in my notes, I'm like, I sure hope I'm not that person for some people. Like, yeah, I sure hope that somebody's not sitting out there going, like, oh, yeah, no, I, I've known that you didn't really know me that well because you got me a gift. But, like, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Like, the gift is, well, it's uh, nice. It just isn't something, I, I don't know, you whatever one a half, right? <laughs> yeah, like, oh, that's nice. I just don't want this thing. Um, some, sometimes people just don't know you all that well, I guess. But sometimes, and maybe some of the same times, and maybe some different times, it's even deeper than that. It's not that they just don't know you. It's it kind of the gift reveals a, a level of care or love. Yeah? We can probably all agree that the greatest gifts come from those people who love us a lot. Like if somebody really, really loves you, you're like, oh, they're probably going to get me a good gift. Actually, in, in fact, um, if they have contempt for you or apathy, they may not give you as good of gifts or no gift at all, or their gift might have an agenda. I don't know. But like the, the contempt and apathy, not so great of gifts as there would be for love and deep affection, right? Um, the greatest gifts come from those kind of folks. And generally, um, those are the gifts that we then really cherish. Because I was like, oh, that was really heartfelt. You know me. You love me. And, uh, and maybe that's why I'm such a great gift giver to myself. Huh. You know, no, but seriously, um, whether it's our love language, if you've ever heard of love languages, some people like love getting gifts and others maybe not as much. Either way, uh, love is often connected to giving and getting gifts. And it's why some people honestly don't like this time of year that much. Because for them, love is not something they feel overwhelmed by in receiving. They feel like they're unloved. Maybe there's some family issues or maybe there's some, some things that have gone on in their life. And so this time of year, yeah, no, they get the fact that gifts and getting them and giving them is connected to love. And that becomes a painful topic for them because um, they, wish, they wish that they could be known. They wish that they could be loved. If only someone could know us like we know ourselves, if, if someone would just love us better than we love ourselves, what a gift that would be. What a gift that would be. Yeah. Well, last week we talked about a young man who dealt with a lot of that kind of rejection. He was just somebody who was overlooked and uh, not really cared for much. This was, again, thousands of years ago, so it's very different than anybody nowadays. But, um, but this guy, he was just, his household chore was to get out of the house. It really was. And the closest thing that this guy David had to friends was a flock. And uh, meaning that most of his wins and woes were heard by wool-covered ears. 
And that was his life, living out in the, like literally his mountaintop moments and his valley moments were literally mountaintop moments and valley moments as he took that herd of sheep around all over Israel and all over Bethlehem and all over that area to try and find some good places for those sheep to eat. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of time by himself. In fact, he chose to spend a lot of that time not re- realizing that he's not by himself and instead reflecting on the, the other one that went with him when he would you know, climb up those mountains or when he flowed down with his flock into every valley. The one who had been there through it all from the start, actually from, as he's gonna say here, from before the start. David knew the Lord personally, intimately, and David knew him lovingly. And so he didn't waste time uh, while walking with his herd Instead, he heard God speak to him things that moved him to write poetry in return. And so we're going to look at one of his poems in totality today. We're going to look at Psalm 139. And so if you have your Bibles, you can look it up, but it's going to be on the screens here too. Um, This is how we got this poem that we're going to read. It's from David just kind of having a lot of time to sit and reflect. So you guys ready? Here we go. Starting in verse one. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge, he just kind of like, just reflects on all that. He's like, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. And I just wanna say, haven't we all been there where we feel like in a moment, we're like, surely this moment is like the dark moment of the soul. This is the moment where God feels so far away from me. David's the one who, by the way, wrote the thing that Jesus quoted on the cross where he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So David gets the fact that there's moments where we feel in life like God is just so far. And he says, if I say that kind of thing, even the darkness is not dark for you. The night is bright as the day for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, oh God, which is what would come next. (laughs) Feels like he definitely changed topics. Anybody? Yeah? Like, man, your thoughts are so great. They're like the sand of the sea. Speaking of which, could you kill people? Um, Like, whoa, whoa, David, are you okay? But but we're going to understand this in just a second. Okay. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, oh God. Oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. And then another switch. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now, um, if you're new to Alive or if you maybe you've been away for the last two or three months, Um, we just got done with a series on parables. And parables and poetry are kind of alike, where parables are stories that Jesus told. Um, the, The reason for using parables and poetry is that they're kind of a cool and creative form of communication. In other words, it's like a joke. It kind of ruins it when you have to explain it, right? So in a sense, I hope we kind of felt the poetry because we're about to dissect it. And that's one of the things we can sometimes rush to in church environments and preaching is like, okay, now let's take this beautiful poetry and let's exposit it. But it is really cool what he says. Can you imagine like, God, you knew me when I was formed in the depths of the earth, which is poetry because he wasn't formed in the depths of the earth. He was formed in the depths of a woman. Yeah, like y'all tracking? So poetry and we're gonna, but here's, here's what I would say. We're gonna break this down. If you wanna do the sections here. The first section is, 
you know everything about me. That's kind of what he covers in verses one through six. You know everything about me, right? When he's like, you know what I'm about to say before I say it. You ruin every joke, God. You're like, you know, you know everything about me in totality. God knows everything about us. Okay, second thing, you're inescapable, you know? And with us through the best and the worst, through the mountaintops and the valleys, the darkest night can't snuff out your light. You are inescapably with us. And then in that next section, he goes in verses 13 and 16, you knew me from before my beginning, from my conception, and knew about each day of my life before I'd lived a single one. So you've been here from before I was, a, as they say, a twinkle in your mother's eye, right? Like you knew me. Uh, all of this he then goes and says is mind blowing. Like, whoa, <laughs> uh, I don't have a framework for really understanding and fully comprehending all of this. Uh, it's beyond me. And then as he's reflecting on the God who knows everything and sees everything and knows every single person intimately, then it kind of makes sense actually that he changed his topic and goes, so then what about all this evil and destruction? Enough of it, you know, right? Right? Like I can't stand people living opposed to a God who's so good and, and knows us and, and that you would just deal with it. God, I wish you would just deal with it. I wish you would kind of take in and deal with it. And then as he's kind of in that vein, I think he has a little bit of moment where he goes, but just so we're clear, and yet, God, I need you to search me too. While you're at it, go digging into me to make me aware of anything in me that needs dealt with. Now, I know, I, I know this isn't a classic Christmas passage. We're in a Christmas series. This is not a classic Christmas passage. There's no manger or magi, right? No Mary or myrrh. Uh, no census during the reign of Quirinius or a guy bringing frankincense. There's none of that stuff in here. It's not very Christmassy, I'll admit. But just so we're clear, David's reflection on some pretty significant um, characteristics about God here is absolute, absolutely going to speak to the, the message of Christmas, the story of Christmas. Like the fact that God knows him and knows us intimately, fully, every move we make. Jesus would actually one, one time say, to kind of help us to picture the fact that God knows us, he knows the number of hairs on your head, which a lot of bald pastors make a joke about. I'm not going to do it, Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Um, but what a thing to be fully known by God, like to be intimately known by God, that he, he knows you in that way uh, entirely. Not just the successful people that we admire does he know everything about, but like the lowly ones like David who were up until that one moment where obviously we get to know his story, they were nobodies. God knows them intimately too. He cares to know everything about them. Hey, Hagar, on your way out from all this stuff, while you feel like unseen, she calls God the God who sees me because God does see her. And God sees you and God sees me. It is both beautiful and absolutely overwhelming if you really start to think about that. To think about the fact that God all sees all of us. And then David also reflects on the fact that he's inescapable. So if you're kind of like, oh, I don't want God to see some of me or I kind of want to run away from God, you can't. Right, Jonah? Like you, you can't. You can try and run, but like God's, God's everywhere. He goes everywhere. You can't outrun um, God or have life box you away from him either. So sometimes we're not running away from him. Sometimes we feel like life has kind of pushed us away, that God must not be close because we can't feel him. But as Isaiah would say, his arm isn't too short to save. He's right there. You're so close, God. He's right there. So again, this is not Christmas per se. Yes? But then David, as we saw here, reflects on another birth story ours, right? And the fact that God knew us before we were born, before we were even conceived, he knew our beginnings, whether it was a silent night or a noisy midday when we were born, he knew it. He, was, uh, he knew the story. He knew how your parents were gonna go ahead and have you, like he knew everything about you. He was there authoring it together. And, uh, and then David just kind of bursts into that. This is too much for my brain to comprehend. Mind-blowing stuff here. I don't have a mental category for all this kind of relationship, but for real though, yeah? Like the fact that God knows the stories of each of us, the big and the small. He's got a mastery over the minutia of every man and woman's story. He just knows it. He knows you. He knows me. And, and since he knows it all, David turns the poem to that whole idea of drink, dealing with evil. And yet God searched me and know if there's any grievous way in me too. And there is in David a grievous way. And there is in me too. And I'm willing to bet, not like I'm a betting pastor, but if I were, I'd be willing to bet money that you have some grievous ways as well. Jack with you, a lot. No, I'm just kidding. 
All of the love, all of the love. If you speak up in my sermon, there will be engagement. I'm just telling you, that's the kind of church we are. Thank you, Jack. You tested it out. There we go. I'm, I'm confident. In fact, the reason I'm confident, and here we'll work into the next slide. Uh, it's said in um, Romans 3, there is no one righteous, no, not one. And in fact, he's quoting Psalms 14 and Psalm 53. So it's in two different Psalms, and then um, Paul goes ahead and quotes it, and he's like very confident, there is no one righteous, no, not one. In fact, Jesus would say, we, a couple weeks ago, we were preaching on the, we were preaching, we were preaching on the rich young ruler, and the fact that in that engagement with the rich young ruler, when he calls Jesus good, Jesus clarifies, there is no one good but God, which coincidentally, Jesus is there going, he is God, Jesus is. So he was the only one good there, but Jesus clarifies, there is no one good. Like, we, we are broken people. We've maybe done a thing or two. And that's just it. Every one of us people that God knows everything about have sinned against God. We've done grievous things, things that broke the heart of God because they went against the will of God, what God designed for our lives, what God desires for our lives. Just a couple of verses down in, from this passage here in Romans 3, he says this classic thing, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his great, wait, we, we sometimes focus on the one part, all have sinned. So that clarifies, by the way, that I'm right when I say that I can, I'm pretty confident that you've sinned. You know, I'm pretty confident there's grievous ways in each and every one of you because every single one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But that's not all it says. And are justified by his grace as a, as a gift. Hey, Christmas. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, I told you this was a Christmas message. Yeah, all of us. Every one of us we know, everyone that we know and everyone that we don't know and everyone who was before us, barring specifically one person, uh, and everyone that's gonna be after us, all of us have sinned. All of us have. All have had a grievous way. If we were to pray that prayer, Psalm 139, 23 and 24, he would not have to necessarily search effortlessly. I hate that word. <laughs> God would search us and he would find the grievous ways, Yeah? Because we've all carried out in some way some kind of evil that permeates the world around us. Um, I know this is really encouraging for you, right? <laughs> we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But the thing is, we all have access to being justified with God. There's a way, even though of us, even those of us who we've, we've fallen short of the glory of God, there's a way to, to have God still accept us, to be justified, to have God look and go, welcome in, come on in. And, and just so we're clear, it's not like a cheat code. It's not like you go ahead and pay him off. It's not a matter of bribery or tricking him or being persuasive and having the right words to say and being really smart and cunning. It is simply through God's love. John three sixteen. this is why Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So God loved the world, so he gave. He personally gave, gave of himself, chose to give his life on a cross so that we could have life in him. God's love took on flesh. That's what we celebrate this time of year, right? In fact, First John, in John's like follow-up letter, he writes another one. He says, um, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. Like it was made manifest. It was made tangible. It was made like palpable that God loved us. It wasn't just a theory. I mean, David wrote about it. Like he knew God loved him, but in Jesus, oh my goodness, it's manifest. Like, you can really see it. Any question is kind of removed because God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. That's what it looks like to have an omnipresent God who's willing to take on human, lim human limitations to show the limitless love of the Father, that God knows us perfectly, right? And yet loves us perfectly. So that's, that leads us to the one thing I hope you get from today. It's simply this, that someone who knows you perfectly and yet loves you perfectly would give you the perfect gift, right? Because have you ever had a gift that became more exciting as soon as you saw who it was from? Anybody? Like you have a gift and you're like, oh, it's from so-and-so. It gets more exciting because so-and-so gives really good gifts. You know, maybe they're wealthy, I don't know. But like, you know, so-and-so gives really good gifts. Or, oh, you know what, ooh, it's from so-and-so. They know me so well. 
they love me and I love them. And wow, like it, it excites us to sometimes see who a gift is from. Well, the from on a gift matters for sure because it tells us an important part of the story of that gift. Who was it that thought to get us something, right? Who was it that thought like, oh, I'm gonna give you something? Who is behind the mystery that is still wrapped up in front of me? Who are we about to be blessed by, right? Like that's what we're kind of thinking. And, and the gift of Jesus was from the greatest gift giver the world has ever known. He knew and knows us perfectly. There's nothing hidden or unaware. So he, he, knows, he knows all the backstory. He knows all your hobbies and interests. And he knows everything about you. He also loves us perfectly. Not a, not a flaw or an insufficiency in it, in his love. And so it just makes sense that if he's gonna give a gift, it's gonna be the greatest gift of all. And Jesus is the perfect gift. Because in Jesus, we are promised perfect peace, perfect love, perfect rest, perfect joy, perfect hope, perfect passion, perfect satisfaction, perfect justice, and so much more. In Jesus, he offers us that perfect thing that our hearts desire. And, um, and just like he first brought the gift in a mysterious way on that night in Bethlehem, right? Sometimes Jesus delivers himself to us in some mysterious ways even still today because that's still how God operates. And so I wanted to um, pass the mic over to Madeline, actually, to share a testimony of how God met her and gifted her in a mysterious way as well. So let's give it up for my wife. Thank you. Um, So I could share a million testimonies of how good God has been to me in the past, especially in the past like five to seven years. But I want to share one from about two and a half weeks ago. and start off by just sharing about something that happened in the summer, because there are just so many, when God tells stories, sometimes he's like, it's just so good. There's so many details that are added to it. So in the summer, um, a lot of you know that we've shared with you guys that Jonathan and I have been uh, walking through infertility, and I've been barren for many years. And um, I believe that God told me that I was going to have a child. And so it's just a promise that I, you know, we believe is going to happen, but don't know when. And in the summer, I was reading the story of Noah and the part where it talks about how God gives them a sign, which is the rainbow. And every time they see the rainbow, it's supposed to, they're supposed to remember I'm always going to keep my promise, my covenant to you. Like that's what they get to remember. Like God's that good that he's like, I'm just going to do this just so that you can remember my goodness, you know? And so when I read that, I just, this idea popped in my mind. I was like, well, God has promised me something. And I want to constantly remind myself that he's going to keep his promise. You know, that's just who he is. So I'm going to come up with something, you know, like that I can, every time I see it, I'm just going to remind myself, God's going to keep his promise to me. So I asked the Lord, I was like, what, what do you want that to be? What should that be? That sign. Um, And I know this sounds really cliche, but I felt like he said flowers. And I was like, okay, it'll be flowers. Every time I see flowers, I can say, God's going to keep his promise to me. And um, the, it was like one or two days later, I'm meeting up with Shay and at Starbucks and we're just hanging out. And she walks into Starbucks with a mason jar with the most beautiful flower (laughs) that she just picked from her yard and just because she brought it. And I just felt so much like it was like two days later that that God was confirming, like, I don't have to do this, but I'm going to because I'm so good. And um, then the day after that, it was a Sunday and it was actually Mother's Day. And Dickie walked in here and brought me a bouquet of flowers just because. And, um, and then the, the next five days, over the next five days, there were three more people that just randomly gave me flowers. Randomly. And so it was like five people that gave me flowers that week. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, the, God is so good just to meet me there. Um, so that then leads to about two and a half weeks ago. Um, It was just a very, very uh, sorrowful week for me, very heavy feeling the sorrow. And again, I just want to say, like, not because I have any doubt in my mind that God's going to keep his promise. It's just sometimes like like a woman in labor, like you're in pain. And it's not not because you think that your child's not coming, like, you know, your child's coming, but you still feel the pain. And so that's kind of where I was at. 
And um, three people just encouraged the mess out of me that week. One was Greta. She came up to me and just said, hey, I just want to let you know that you have been on my heart. You and Jonathan, I have been praying for you. And um, a lot of meaningful things she said, but one of them was, God has not forgotten you. And again, not that I believe he had. It was just so uh, meaningful to me that she said that. And um, I felt loved not just by her, but I also felt so loved by the Lord, just like that he sees me and he loves me. And he didn't have to say that, and he did. Um, And then two days later, I'm hanging out with Deb Burkle, and um, we're just having a conversation. Jonathan's there. And at one point, she's talking about, um, if you never talked to Deb Burkle, she's such a blessing. She, she's just so passionately talking about, like, strengthening yourself in the Lord. And she's talking about how good it is. And she's like, it's so, Jesus is so good. Like, I just want everybody to know how good it is to run to him and strengthen yourself in him. And at one point, she looks at me and she's like, in a way of like, you know what I'm talking about. She, she says, points to me and she says, you strengthen yourself in the Lord. Uh, You know how to do it, and you do it. And um, in that moment, like, we're just having a conversation. It wasn't particularly um, encouraging or whatnot. Um, But two days later, I am just feeling the uh, deepest sorrow, not just about um, barrenness, but other, like, desolate um, areas of my life. And um, feeling the weight of that. And Jonathan goes to life group. So I'm at home by myself and I'm sitting on the couch and I have a ton of work to do. And I'm thinking, okay, like I'll just distract myself with work. And I hear Deb's voice in my head so loud and clear. You know how to strengthen yourself in the Lord and you do it. And I just like, I love that God invited me to strengthen myself in him through Deb's voice. Like, it, like he used her voice to speak to me, and I just knew I was supposed to drop everything and spend time with him. So I'm sitting on the couch, and I'm like, okay, I will spend time with you, Lord. I, I'd rather distract myself and not feel these feelings, but I, I'm, I'm going to give them to you. So I read my Bible for a little bit, and then I decide to pick up my journal from our sabbatical in January because God spoke to me a lot during that time. And um, I opened it up, and I read about a promise that I feel like he gave me in 2018. And that promise, I am not the kind of person that anytime I see something cool in the Bible that I just insert my name, I'm like, and that's a promise for me. I'm not that type of person. But when I was reading this verse in 2018, um, I felt like this picture was so beautiful, and I felt like God told me, I love doing this. And I am going to do this in these areas, these desolate areas of your life. And I felt like he promised me that. So um, the verse was from Ezekiel, and it shows up in a couple places. But it basically says uh, something along the lines of there is a, this desolate land is going to become like the Garden of Eden. It's going to be fortified and inhabited and fruitful. And I felt like God told me, like, that's not about me in the Bible, but that he was going to do that in my life. And so I just held on to that promise. Um, And in um, January, I was reminded of that. And I was like, oh, I forgot about this beautiful promise. Um, God, I haven't seen it fulfilled yet, but I totally trust you that it's going to happen. Would you fulfill this for me? So I'm sitting on my couch two and a half weeks ago, and I'm reading this promise. And I was like, oh, I forgot about this beautiful promise. It's so beautiful that these desolate areas in my life, you're going to make them like the Garden of Eden. Um, that is so beautiful. And I just set aside my journal, and I just start weeping before him, saying, it hurts so bad. Like this sorrow is so deep and I just need to feel your presence right now, God. I just need some relief. I need you to comfort me. I need you to speak to me. And I just beg him like, please show up for me. I need you to speak to me. And I'm sitting there for about 10 minutes just in silence, just listening, um, waiting. And my phone rings. (laughs) And it's somebody I don't normally talk to. So I was like, oh, it must be, there must be something wrong. So I pick up the phone and I'm like, 
hello. And um, the woman is a believer, lovely person. And she says, Madeline, I'm so sorry. This is so out of the blue. And you're probably really busy right now. But I, um, I was just like listening to a podcast or a sermon or something in my car while I was driving. And your face popped into my mind. And I knew I had to stop and pray for you. And so I was praying for you. And God gave me a picture. And I have to share it with you right now. In fact, I have goosebumps. I just like, I know I'm supposed to tell you this right now. So first off, already I'm feeling so loved that like it was within 10 minutes. So when I am crying out to the Lord saying, please speak to me, he is telling somebody else, some random person to pray for me and giving them a picture. And so um, I already am feeling so loved by the Lord that he is answering me now. Um, but she goes on to tell me that this picture, and she does not know, you know, that I just read about this promise and then cried out to the Lord about it. The picture was, a huge field and it was full of tulips and I just like I was sobbing on the other end and you know she doesn't really understand what's going on but um it was full of, it, it not just like like a desolate land becoming like the Garden of Eden, but this field was full of tulips, which are a flower, which is the sign that I felt like the Lord told me every time I see flowers that he wants me to remember he's going to keep his promise to me. And so it's just like layers of meaningful things that God is so good. And, and all I want to share with you guys, like out of this experience, I want to testify to his goodness. Um, but I also just want to encourage you that um, when the church is operating how God designed, things like this happen all the time. Like when you are listening to the Holy Spirit, when you are listening to his voice, he, he loves to speak to us directly, but he also loves to speak to us through one another. And it's so meaningful to me that I have been so built up by the people in our church, but it's also meaningful to a lot of the people who were the ones telling me, because they're like, wow, I did hear God correctly, you know? Like, I got to be used in this way. It's so beautiful when the church operates in this way. But all of that said, my deepest heart's desire is that in these places of desolation or wildernesses um, in my life, there's a verse in, I believe it's Psalm 78, where the Israelites, out of disbelief, say, in the wilderness, they say, can God set a table in the wilderness? And more than anything, like in this wilderness of my own, I want when people look at me to see the goodness of God. And I want to be able to testify and let you all know, yes, he can. He can set a feast in the wilderness. And I have experienced that all of these years that I have been nourished and strengthened so much when I've run to Jesus every single time he has showed up. And so, um, yeah, I just hope so much that uh, this week or whenever that you always run to Jesus because he will show up and he is so, so good. Um, you can come up, yeah. Yeah, that was it. Friends, he sees us. He sees us. All of us. For some of us, it's the idea that, like, you know what, where you feel unseen and unheard, today is a reminder that you are not unseen and not unheard. For some of us, it might be that we kind of wish we were unseen by God. That we wish that maybe God didn't see us because we know that if God saw everything about us, we wouldn't be thrilled by that. We'd have the guilt and the shame that comes with knowing that we have, we've sinned against him. But God already knew that. All have sinned. Fall short of the glory of God. And so God didn't say, well, best, best of luck figuring it out. He gave us the gift of perfect love. So God sees us. The yearnings of our heart the brokenness of our hearts and our lives. He loves us in a perfect love so that we can be healed. 
what does it look like for us then to recognize the perfection of the gift of Jesus for us? Because again, a two is really important, but in this case, the from is a lot more important. The, yes, it's to you, this gift of Jesus, but it's from the God who knows you intimately, loves you perfectly. What does it look like for you and I to just really celebrate, relish, accept, just appreciate the gift of Jesus for ourselves? But this is why Madeline's like, wait, you're gonna have me share that at the end? I was kind of thinking it would be a call to worship. I'm like, yeah, it is. A call to worship with the rest of our lives that in Madeline's story, we get to see that, and not just in hers, that's just one example, but that God, like I said, he revealed his love to us in a really particularly peculiar way by sending a baby to Bethlehem. And I'm sure that like the names that were mentioned here today as she kind of went through these stories weren't thinking, oh, I'm gonna be revealing the love of God to Madeline today. I'm gonna be showing Madeline today that God sees her. No, there's just simply a prompting on their heart. Or, and they may not even think it's from God. You just see a flower and you're like, I wanna get a flower for a friend. I just wanna say something that I think is encouraging. Friends, one of the things I told you last week I wanna do with this series is not just have it be personally applicable for you, and I hope it is today, but I wanna mobilize our church more and more in this Christmas season to realize that God is still doing that kind of stuff all over the place that he is looking to position us. The beauty of Madeline's story is that God delights in using people to deliver the gift of God's love to others. He loves doing it. Can we just listen to the Holy Spirit? Can we have hearts that are tuned so that when he speaks things, we don't have to necessarily go through a whole list of like, well, you need to prove to me. We just kind of go, okay, God, I don't know what this means, or I don't know why you're asking me to do this, or I don't know what this is gonna maybe be a part of in a bigger way. But what if listening to the Holy Spirit could help us to communicate to somebody else the fact that God knows them, that God sees them, that God loves them, and that the gift that Jesus has come to give us of salvation is for them? Wouldn't it be awesome, friends, if we could be a part of someone else's story like that? So I want us to reflect here as we, we go back into worship on what it means for us to know that Jesus knew us when he came for us. He knew you perfectly, loves you perfectly. What does it also mean for us to recognize that we can be a part of helping others to see and sense the love of God? So God, we come to you and ask you, I guess really two things. One, Lord, my prayer is that every person in this room would have today be a special day where we just relish in the fact that the gift of Jesus came from the God who knows us more than anyone else does and yet loves us more than ever, anyone else ever could. God, would you help some people who feel unseen and unknown to have that lie just be snuffed out today? Would you have people that feel unloved and uncared for, have that be squashed by the truth that God loves them so much that he gave his one and only son that we could have eternal life? God, if there's anybody in the room today that maybe hasn't experienced that, that gift personally and they haven't accepted that gift, Lord, I pray that today is the day. But for anyone and everyone who already has, Lord, may we relish in it like it's maybe the first time we're hearing it because it's just so good. And may we also, Lord, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see that this gift isn't just for us, but that we can be a part of extending the fact that, that God loves and knows other people to other people. Lord, would we have our hearts tuned to hear your voice so that in these moments where we get to be that voice to others, we would know, we would know that it's you. We would hear your voice. We'd listen. We'd respond with obedience. God, this time of year, as we said before, there's a lot of people who feel unloved and unseen. Wouldn't it be awesome if your people could show this world that hope has come, that perfect love has come, God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.